It was a strange place for two teenage boys to be, lying on the train tracks in the middle of the woods near Bryan, Arkansas. By the time the three men in the lead engine of the northbound Union Pacific saw the boys, it was already too late. Risking derailment, the engineer threw the mile-long train into emergency and laid down on its horn. Despite the vibration of the tracks, the screeching of metal against metal and the deafening blast of the horn, the boys didn't move. The train's powerful headlight allowed the engineer, conductor, and brakeman to see that the boys were lying side by side across the tracks in identical positions, their bodies partially covered with a tarp. Moments later, the train overtook the motionless boys. The victims were Don Henry, 16, and Kevin Ives, 17, both of Saline County, Arkansas. They would have started their senior year at Bryant High School the next day. Kevin had spent the night at Don's house, and the two had ventured outside a little after midnight, never to return. Little did anyone know at the time that these two friends had unwittingly stumbled upon an underworld of drug smuggling and government corruption a cover-up of unbelievable proportions was about to begin. Kevin and Don were near the tracks that night and saw either money or drugs dropped from an airplane. Uh, I believe that law enforcement officers killed them and uh, the cover-up began immediately, um, expanded to the medical examiner, Fami Malik. At the time, Fami Malik, Arkansas State Medical Examiner, was the one responsible for ruling on cause of death. His plan was to rule the boy's death a double suicide. However, after conferring with Jim Steed, Saline County Sheriff, they decided no one would accept such a ruling and change the cause of death to accidental. We were absolutely puzzled and outraged over the ruling uh, of accidental as a manner of death. Uh, we didn't think that the facts supported that ruling. Uh, and what we started out to do was just to obtain a second opinion. Uh, we met resistance from all fronts, from law enforcement, from the crime lab. Uh, we retained an attorney and a private investigator and obtained court orders to get um, testable samples of everything that they had in order to get a second opinion. And Femi Malik refused to obey the court orders. Without any supporting evidence, Malik ruled that the boys had each smoked more than 20 marijuana cigarettes and in a psychedelic stupor had fallen asleep on the tracks. It was later learned that the state crime lab never even tested for the concentration of marijuana and in fact had used a test on the boy's blood which was designed to be used on urine. Outside experts were shocked at the absurd ruling. The family's nightmare battle against the state medical examiner was made more difficult by Governor Clinton's public support of Malik. However, after 13 long months, the parents were finally able to prove what they had believed all along that the boys had indeed been murdered. 17-year-old Kevin Ives and 16-year-old Don Henry were struck by a train near Alexander. The medical examiner has said that the boys were asleep and drugged with marijuana. The parents, however, disputed that claim and persuaded authorities to reopen the case. Because of their persistence, Kevin and Don's bodies were exhumed. New autopsies were performed and a grand jury was convened. Dr. Joseph Burton, a nationally recognized forensic pathologist from out of state performed the new autopsies. His findings revealed that Don Henry had been stabbed in the back and Kevin Ives' face had been smashed by a blow from a rifle butt before their bodies were placed on the railroad tracks. This information alone would strongly suggest that the boys were injured, uh, rendered unconscious or even killed prior to their bodies being run over by the train. Burton's autopsies also revealed that Malik had mutilated Kevin's skull by sawing it in so many different directions that it was impossible to tell where the original skull fractures were. Malik also had completely dismantled Kevin's jawbones. Burton stated he had performed thousands of autopsies and had never seen anything like it. Was Malik trying to hide something? Was there a step 
The answer is no, they were not stabbed. Were they dead beforehand? Absolutely no, they were alive. A former employee at the crime lab has said he discovered what appeared to be evidence of a stab wound during the original autopsy, but was told, quote, not to worry about it. Malik has refused all comment. The deaths of these two boys uh, most probably were not accidental deaths, but that they met their death as a result of injuries inflicted on them by other uh, people or another person. In addition to Burton, two other forensic pathologists and seven forensic investigators with more than 100 years accumulated experience investigating homicides reviewed the case. It was their collective opinion that the ruling be changed to murder. During the midst of all of um, the turmoil uh, with trying to get the ruling changed in our case, it became very apparent that uh, this was not an isolated instance of an error in the ruling on the manner of death. Uh, there were many other cases statewide that um, we became aware of. In 1992, the Los Angeles Times tallied more than 20 additional cases where Dr. Malik had falsified evidence and ruled incorrectly. One case involved the murder of Raymond Albright, who had been shot five times in the chest with a Colt 45. Incredibly, Malik had ruled suicide. Another involved James Dewey Milam, whose body was found without the head. In this case, Malik ruled the cause of death to be an ulcer. Although Milam's head had been clearly severed with a knife, Malik claimed the family pooch had bitten off the head, eaten the entire thing and then regurgitated. Malik says he tested the dog's vomit and found traces of Milam's brain and skull. Unfortunately for Dr. Malik, Milam's head was later found. Malik, it turns out, had made up the entire story. Media coverage of Malik's dishonest rulings resulted in a massive public outcry calling for his removal from office. The medical examiner comes up and he has fabrication to where he has, has, has created his own evidence. This is of a magnitude that could create a national scandal, and if necessary, it will. I have work to do. That's not you, zombie. I have work to do. Excuse yes. me, please. And what you, and you uh, can say that you are honest. Dr. Now. Lying on his autopsy cases, lying in court. Yeah. And he's not an honest person. And why should he be prosecuted? He should be prosecuted. Nevertheless, both Governor Clinton and the Arkansas State Medical Examiner Commission Chairman, Jocelyn Elders, who had the power to remove Malik from office, not only insisted he remain, they gave him a raise. Based on the facts I have, I really feel that Arkansas owes Dr. Malik a great debt and a real apology. Today, the governor was asked if Malik should resign. I don't think that's a decision that I should make based on what I now know. It didn't matter what Malik did, whether it was uh, perjure himself in court, fabricate evidence in murder trials, call coroners murderers. Uh, Clinton defended him by uh, excusing it as being stressed out, uh, overworked, and underpaid. Uh, his testimony compromised evidence in a lot of felony cases in Arkansas. And uh, it was very transparent that um, Fammy Malik had some kind of hold over Bill Clinton. Uh, the end result was that he was given a $14,000 raise. It was an absolute insult to my family. Read my lips. I'm not going to comment. I was outraged that protecting a political crony of Clinton's was more important than the fact that two young boys had been murdered. Despite the policy of investigating any suspicious death as a homicide until proven otherwise, the Saline County deputy who took control of the scene where Kevin and Don were murdered immediately ordered it worked as an accident. Procedures were never taken to protect the scene and properly collect evidence. But we were told to work as an accident, you know, or the investigators were told to work as an accident, and it was uh, not enough time and emphasis put into it right there at the scene. Against all standard police procedures, the back of the train was used as a reference point to record the location of the boys' bodies and possessions. Once the train left, the reference point was lost forever, and the information gathered became totally useless. Our local investigation was headed by our sheriff, Jim Steed. He later went on television bragging about 
what a thorough investigation he had conducted and that uh, he felt very sorry for us as parents, but that he had every confidence in Femi Malik's ruling. Their investigation was so thorough that they left my son's foot out there for two days in plain sight. A number of pieces of evidence collected at the scene eventually turned up missing. Police refused to acknowledge the existence of this gun even though its collection by police was captured on video. Likewise, all three members of the train crew observed a tarp covering the boys' bodies on the tracks prior to the impact. The conductor even showed investigators where the tarp had landed after the impact. Nevertheless, the police denied the tarp's existence. Paramedics. The paramedics. Yeah, I believe well, that that, the, the paramedics picked up a tarp from the boys. I believe that's. That, they had it coming down the railroad anyway. They had. They had body bags. Right. Going, walking down through you, picking up different, you know. But separate from the body bag was was a tarp. Right. Right. Remember what color it was? I can't remember. Everything was kind of in a chaos. Sure. And, you know, I really didn't pay that. That, that that thing much attention. Sure. I knew it was uh, some kind of a tarp. You yes, know, sir. it wasn't a bad body bag. Because they had it, you know, more or less folded. And close as I can remember, they laid it down right there. When we began hearing rumors about a tarp covering Kevin and Don on the tracks, we questioned Saline County law enforcement about it. Rick Elmendorf and Chuck Talent uh, sat here in my living room and told us that they were absolutely certain that that was an optical illusion that the train crew had seen, that uh, they had conducted tests on their clothing, which would have revealed fibers from a tarp impacted either on the clothing or the bodies themselves. We found out much later that that was a lie. Uh, they had never conducted tests on their clothing. And uh, my interpretation is, of that is that um, they had some reason to lie, uh, uh, perhaps were even involved themselves. And what would turn out to be the most ironic twist in this case? Deputy Prosecutor Richard Garrett and his friend Defense Attorney Dan Harmon approached Linda Ives and convinced her that they would do everything in their power to catch those responsible for the murder of their son. Harmon was subsequently appointed Special Prosecutor to head the grand jury probe. However, as his investigation advanced, potential witnesses began turning up dead. May, 1988. Keith Coney, who was believed to be with Kevin and Don that night, told friends and family members that law enforcement officials were responsible for the murders. Two days later, he was killed when his motorcycle crashed while he was being chased. According to some officers, his throat had previously been slashed and he was apparently fleeing his attackers when he lost control. However, this crucial information was left out of the final report. There was no autopsy or investigation. And I don't think it was an accident because he was fearing for his life, you know, a couple of months before. He said a couple of times that he knew people, that he was being watched and he was afraid. Mrs. Alexander says her son knew the two teenagers run over by the train, and she says he indicated to her he had been there when the boys had died, that he spotted two attackers. But he knew there was two there. I did try to get him to tell me who, and he, he was either afraid or didn't know. November, 1988. Keith McCaskill, who was allegedly at the tracks that night, turned over information he had about the boys' murders to Richard Garrett. Believing he had talked to the wrong people, McCaskill had made his own funeral arrangements, told family and friends goodbye, and within days was murdered himself, stabbed 113 times. His murder remains unsolved. On the night of uh, elections in 1988, uh, he took two pennies out of his pocket and threw them on the bar there at the wagon wheel and said, if Jim Steed loses this election, my life isn't worth two cents. And he was murdered that night. Harmon, Garrett, and members of the Arkansas police suddenly found themselves in the awkward position of having to try and convince the public that the deaths of these key witnesses coming at a crucial point in the investigations were merely a coincidence. I think that Mr. McCaskill was probably suffering from a lot of paranoia. And right now the indications are that nobody else was involved. Might there have been a reason though for his paranoia? I'm sure there was a reason for his paranoia. Uh, 
because he had talked to the police or the prosecutor? I don't know that that would be the reason. What about uh, the murder? Is it connected at all with the uh, grand jury investigation? Not that we know of. McCaskill was a witness in the Bryant train deaths investigation. Although police haven't ascertained a motive for the murder, they say there's no connection. Would link uh, this investigation to the death of Don Henry or Kevin Ives. And I don't foresee anything in, in uh, the pursuance of the rest of this investigation that would be uh, anything that would uh, make me change my mind. Those believing in a massive cover-up by police and elected officials, which included the possible murder of witnesses, watched in horror as the death toll continued to climb. January 1989, Greg Collins, who failed to appear after being subpoenaed to testify before Kevin and Don's grand jury, was killed by a shotgun blast to the face. His murder remains unsolved. March 1989, Booney Bearden, a friend of both Coney and Collins, disappeared. An article of Bearden's clothing was found in the vicinity where an anonymous caller claimed his murder had taken place. His body was never recovered. April 1989, Jeff Rhodes was murdered after telling his family he knew too much about Kevin, Don, and McCaskill's murders. Rhodes had been shot in the head and his remains set on fire in a dump. July 1989, Richard Winters, another grand jury witness, was gunned down during a robbery, which apparently was staged to cover his murder. His case remains unsolved. June 1990, Jordan Kettleson, who was believed to be connected to the McCaskill murder, was killed by a shotgun blast to the head. There was no police investigation, and his body was cremated before an autopsy could be performed. June 1995, Mike Samples, another grand jury witness, was shot to death. Sources claim he had been involved in retrieving drugs dropped from airplanes. Authorities have denied any connection between these cases and the murders of Kevin and Don. The people whose testimony might have solved this case years ago have systematically been eliminated. There apparently was a great deal of fear that these people could implicate very powerful players. The eight-month-long grand jury investigation into Kevin and Don's murder came to an abrupt halt December 31, 1988. Last-minute legal maneuvering by Harmon, Garrett, and presiding judge John Cole prevented the jurors from revealing their findings in the final report. The men and women of the grand jury were sent home frustrated that they had not been allowed to do their job. The Saline County Special Grand Jury has now disbanded. Three hours ago, it delivered its final report on the deaths of two teenage boys. But the grand jury was not allowed to do what it wanted. I know that because you could not repeat in the report much of the testimony that you heard and evidence that you received, <laughs> that you are somewhat frustrated by it. And that's understandable. In the final analysis, I know that the grand jury hated to, at this point to give it up because I think the public needs to know about the uh, seriousness of the drug problem here in Saline County and maybe other surrounding counties. It was now two and a half years since the incident of the boys on the tracks. Saline County Deputy Prosecutor Gene Duffy was asked to head up the newly created drug task force. The job would require her to investigate drug trafficking in a three-county area of Arkansas, including Saline County. However, on the day she was appointed, her boss, Prosecutor Gary Arnold, gave her a peculiar command. Gary Arnold came into my office, stood in front of my desk, looked me straight in the face and said, Gene, you are not to use the drug task force to investigate any public official. He turned on his heel and marched out. Now, as startling as that statement might sound, I really didn't think that it was going to pose any kind of problem because at that time, I didn't have any indication that there was any public official in our judicial district who was involved in drugs. Almost immediately, Jean's undercover team discovered that a number of public officials in her district were indeed involved in drug trafficking. Gary Arnold's directive had now become a dilemma. Jean couldn't include the information in her reports because Arnold would know she was disobeying orders. Also, in case Arnold himself was involved in the corruption, 
She didn't want him to have access to this information. There was, however, a solution. I knew at the time that there had been a federal investigation going on for about nine months into the public official corruption in Saline County, which was being headed by Assistant U.S. Attorney Bob Govar. So Govar seemed to be the likely person to take this information to, which I did, and he was appreciative because it supported the information that he had already been gathering, plus added to and gave him new information to uh, broaden his investigation. Bob Govar had been assigned by U.S. Attorney Chuck Banks to head the Federal Organized Crime and Drug Enforcement Task Force. Govar had already developed substantial information linking public officials to drug activities by the time Gene Duffy's task force was operational. In July of 1990, one of Gene Duffy's undercover officers developed evidence linking the train deaths to public officials and drugs. Three years had passed since the boys had been killed, and Jean had no way of knowing that her drug task force was about to be shut down for nearly solving Kevin and Don's murders. It didn't occur to me that it was appropriate for our drug task force to reopen the case of the boys on the track until one of my undercover officers came to me and told me that not only was the case drug related, but it was also solvable. He asked permission to investigate, and I agreed to that and told him that we would take our information then to Bob Govar. Ironically, Dan Harmon and Richard Garrett, the very same men who had conducted the grand jury investigation of Kevin and Don's murders, were two of the main targets of Govar's drug and corruption investigation. Linda Ives, who for years had believed Harmon and Garrett were sincerely trying to solve her son's murder, now realized they were the ones orchestrating the cover-up. We certainly don't have any suspects at uh, this point in time. It's been quite a while, um, and, and I, I really didn't anticipate that it would take this long when we first started. I'm frustrated in the amount of time that it's taken. Frustrated that we weren't able to accomplish some things we probably should have been able to. Whatever comes out of it, if someone's charged or not charged, uh, the grand jury has done a tremendous job. But it still will leave the open question where, uh, if the boys were murdered, who did it? Well, until it's solved, that's correct. To make matters worse, Harmon suddenly became the prosecutor elect for a three county district, which included Saline County. Harmon who had friends in the Arkansas press, wasted no time in launching a massive media smear campaign against Gene Duffy. He immediately began a uh, media crusade against me. First of all, using uh, the Benton Courier and Linda Hollenbeck as the reporter, and he also used the uh, Arkansas Democrat and Doug Thompson as the reporter. And for some reason, these two people would write anything that he said to them. They didn't care anything about substantiating anything he said. They just reported it. In the next five months, there were over 200 newspaper articles crucifying my reputation. Not one thing that they alleged was truthful. They had me stealing federal funds. They had me making illegal arrests. Um, every allegation that would might destroy my credibility was made. I could have played the same game Harmon was playing and reported to the media the information that I had about him and truth would have been on my side but this would have jeopardized the federal investigation. And I wasn't so concerned about public opinion of me because I felt like in the end all the truth was going to come out because at this point I still had faith in the judicial system. Harmon was pounding Gene from every angle. He influenced the filing of a $1.2 million lawsuit against Gene. He facilitated the sabotage of task force records through a fiscal officer who was reporting to Harmon. And he was threatening task force informants whose names had been given to him by a task force agent Gene had fired. By September of 1990, Harmon's smear campaign had reached a critical point, And Gene knew that unless Harmon was indicted, her days as head of the task force were numbered. Govar repeatedly assured Jean that indictments against Harmon and others were imminent, but they did not come in time to save Jean's job. According to Govar, his boss, U.S. Attorney Chuck Banks, was the holdup. The members of my board 
of directors had warned me for several weeks that they were not going to be able to continue to support me in the face of all of the bad publicity. And in fact, when they did fire me finally in November, it was not because of anything that I had done wrong, but because I had become, in their opinion, ineffective because of all of the bad press. I had seven undercover officers working for me. They, they were family men who needed jobs. Five of them resigned in protest to my firing. Although no longer head of the task force, Gene and the task force officer who had been investigating the train deaths continued to gather evidence. In December of 1990, Jean and her officer went to U.S. Attorney Chuck Banks with her case. This signaled the beginning of the end of the federal investigation. Although Banks promised Jean and her officer they could testify before the grand jury, that never happened. However, several witnesses developed by Jean's task force did testify. One of them was Charlene Wilson, a former girlfriend of both Dan Harmon and convicted drug felon Roger Clinton, Governor Clinton's brother. Charlene was recommended to our task force as an informant from a DEA who had used her as an informant and also from at least two other law enforcement agencies that had used her as an informant and said that she was reliable. I uh, used Charlene and she proved to be very, very reliable. There was not one bit of information that she ever gave me that didn't pan out. Dan always had cocaine on him, always. Robert Govar and Chuck Banks were the U.S. attorneys for the District of Arkansas at that time. I was subpoenaed to testify on behalf of the drug trafficking and the cartel, more or less is what it was, uh, that had to do with Dan Harmon. I was asked quite in depth about the drug trafficking that went on with Dan Harmon, um, Mr. Clinton, Roger Clinton. The very afternoon that Charlene testified before the federal grand jury, that the whole investigation started to unravel. I had taken in four informants to be interviewed uh, to testify before the federal grand jury in Saline County Affairs. They were actually never interviewed and were in fact badgered and harassed and told to leave. I received a phone call um, and they told me that um, I had made a very big mistake and I was assured by the U.S. Attorney's Office that my name, that my, my testimony, that my statements, that the people that were on that witness list would never ever be revealed. Well, ha ha, you know, someone in the U.S. Attorney's Office had given Mr. Harmon a list of the effective witnesses, you know. I don't give you a very good feeling. I'm scared of these people. I'm very scared of them. Even with her job and reputation gone, Jean knew too much and was still a threat to Dan Harmon. One of his first acts after taking office as district prosecutor was to call for a grand jury to investigate Jean. The jurors, however, quickly realized Harmon's accusations were untrue and refused to indict her. Harmon's next step was to subpoena Jean and force her to hand over the information she had uncovered about him and other corrupt Arkansas officials. I refused to answer the subpoena because in the first place it was absurd for Dan Harmon to be conducting a grand jury investigation against himself. But if I had brought in any information about him, that would have put the very lives, probably, of the informants and witnesses in jeopardy, and I was certainly not willing to do that. If I had gone in and refused to turn any information over to them, I would have been jailed in Hot Spring County, and my mother received a call from a dispatcher in Hot Spring County that said that she overheard a conversation among the officials there that if I were arrested that I would be killed in Hot Spring County Jail. So I refused to answer and when Judge Coe issued a felony warrant for my arrest for failing to appear, then I left the jurisdiction. Even though Judge Cole had issued an illegal warrant, there was no one in authority in Arkansas willing to take a stand for Gene. 
While in hiding and away from her family, Jean waited for the long-promised indictments from the federal grand jury. She knew that once the charges were brought against Dan Harmon and other officials, she would be able to go home and clear her name. This was an especially difficult time for her family because her children were being followed and her home was under surveillance. Weeks turned into months. Then without warning, U.S. Attorney Chuck Banks announced that no indictments would be issued and the federal grand jury investigation of Saline County's corruption would be shut down. All public officials under investigation, including Dan Harmon, were cleared of all wrongdoing. Jean was stunned. Three grand jurors contacted me, two of them indirectly and one of them directly, to inform me that they were ready to hand down indictments, but they were informed by Chuck Banks that the grand jury was being dismissed and that no indictments would be sought. They were not told that they had the authority to hand indictments down on their own. In my opinion, Chuck Banks should have been charged with obstructing justice. When Chuck Banks closed down the federal investigation, we were stunned. We couldn't understand what made Kevin and Don's murder so important and who had the power to shut down a federal investigation. In protest, Bob Govar resigned as lead counsel of the federal task force and was then demoted by his boss, Chuck Banks. Jean Duffy and her family were forced to leave the state. It was now five and a half years since Kevin and Don's murders. Detective John Brown, a 16-year law enforcement veteran, had moved his family into the Saline County area. The Ives family had asked the new sheriff to reopen the case, and John was given the assignment. However, just like Gene Duffy, John's first day on the job included a peculiar request from his boss. My uh, immediate supervisor, who was a lieutenant over the Saline County Criminal Investigation Division, took me for a ride that lasted approximately one hour. Um, during this ride to literally nowhere, uh, it appeared the whole purpose was to tell me to leave the case alone. He said things like, there's not anything to this. Um, this could have been an accident. It's going to bring you a lot of grief if you continue on and, and do this. And, and in the end, he finally said, you know, John, you really need to leave this alone. John was disturbed by his superior's attitude, and his concern escalated once he began examining the Ives-Henry case file. It had become obvious that uh, once I started going through the case file, it had been robbed of most of the pertinent evidence. Uh, no crime scene photographs, a list of evidence was not present, the things you would expect to find. Despite discouragement from his own department, John went forward with the investigation. Beginning at square one, he began tracking down the missing evidence. Several witnesses were contacted, including Charlene Wilson, who by this time, was being held at a jail in a neighboring county. I run across a young lady named Charlene Wilson who told a horror story that I didn't really believe at the time. So I started searching for evidence to substantiate just part of what she had said. Herman went ballistic, called, he threatened me, threatened Sheriff Pridgen, threatened Captain Gene Donham, the chief deputy, all because I talked to this one woman Charlene believed she had been set up by Dan Harmon in retaliation for her testimony against him. The team of Prosecutor Harmon and Judge Cole managed to convict and sentence her to an unbelievable 30 years in the Arkansas Department of Correction. Guess who arrested her? Dan Harmon. The very guy that she says turned her on to drugs now has her arrested. Dan Harmon, he walked to me handed me what was supposed to be a search warrant, and he said, bitch, excuse me for saying that, I told you, if you ever, ever brought my name up or brought anything up about the past dealings that we've had, that I'd take you down. He said, you're going to prison. I'm going to put you in prison. He did. I'm here. I mean, I, I've watched second, third offense people walk around with probation on top of probation on top of probation. Not this lady. First time she's been arrested for drugs, 
they allege that they found in her home, she gets 30 years. Sure, everybody ought to be able to see through this. You have to look at judges. You have to look at prosecutors, local attorneys, and law enforcement officials. Now, these are the people that enforce the drug laws, that prosecute the drug laws, and judge the drug laws. And yet, they are webbed in with the drug trade in the state of Arkansas. John quickly understood why Charlene had been put away. During her sworn deposition, she dropped a bombshell that would later be confirmed by other eyewitnesses. She was with Dan Harmon at the tracks the night Kevin and Don were murdered. The people at the track that night, to my knowledge, were Dan Harmon. I do know that the boys were watching the drop site, okay? And they got curious as to what was being dropped there. According to reports from the FBI, DEA, Customs, and the Arkansas State Police, money and drugs were indeed being dropped from low-flying aircraft at night. These drops were part of a major drug smuggling operation headquartered at the airport in Mena, Arkansas. In 1982, cocaine trafficker Barry Seal had moved his multi-million dollar cocaine smuggling operation from Louisiana to Arkansas and was permitted by government officials to continue his activities without interference. Arkansas State Police Investigator Russell Welsh and IRS Federal Agent Bill Duncan accumulated more than 20,000 pages of documents detailing the drug trafficking and money laundering activities at MENA. The airplanes, the aircraft that, that Barry Seal had there at Richmond Aviation were, there was only one purpose for them. There was only one use for that type of aircraft and that was uh, smuggle cocaine. They had special uh, uh, cargo doors installed in the side without FAA permission uh, so that these uh, doors could be opened in flight. They'd uh, pull in, slide back, and, and the cocaine could be dropped out of the side in flight. Indictments were prepared against 29 individuals and presented to a federal grand jury in 1986. Barry Seal was scheduled to testify in Arkansas when suddenly he was gunned down. Bill Duncan and I interviewed Barry Seal less than two months before he was killed. Uh, and uh, he was served with a subpoena at that time. He was under subpoena to come to Arkansas and testify before the grand jury here when he was killed. 20 other witnesses were scheduled to testify, but only three were allowed to appear before the grand jury. Two of those witnesses were barred from presenting any evidence. As expected, the grand jury was shut down and no indictments were issued. The drug smuggling activities continued after Seal's death. To date, a total of nine separate state and federal investigations into MENA have been shut down. The first indication I had that MENA may tie to the death of these two kids was through an audio tape provided to me by Russell Welch, an Arkansas State Police investigator assigned to MENA. The tape was of a confidential informant inside the federal corrections facility. That tape would allege that Don Henry and Kevin Ives were killed because of a connection to Mena, Arkansas. An actual report was generated by Saline County Sheriff's Office in 1987 and in 88 of people complaining of the planes flying over the tracks at approximately 100 feet above ground level with their lights out at night. One of the pilots who had been involved in the Mena drug smuggling operation, when interviewed by John, indicated the area where the boys had been murdered was indeed a drop site location known as A-12. He described to me an aerial view of the tracks. If you were coming in from the west, flying to the east toward Little Rock, he described a mountain to the right and flying over a set of railroad track lights that govern the trains. The thing about these lights, they stretched across the tracks. The train drove under them. Then he said you could see a runway, a small runway to the left, appeared to be private, and then a beacon on top of a building to the right, and then you would know to make the drop. I have interviewed five pilots, four of which can verify the A-12 location being the tracks 
just west of Little Rock, Arkansas, where these two kids' bodies were found. Thanks for joining us tonight on American Investigator. This is our final segment, so please make your calls brief. Let's go back to the phones. Uh, Jerry in Huntington, Arkansas. Go ahead, you're on the program. Is there any connection, Mr. Brown, between this drug operation in Mena and the death of the two young boys on the railroad track that were murdered and were ruled accidental death by state medical examiner Fanny Malik? There have been some allegations, I think is what the caller is talking about, that they had stumbled on an airdrop that had, was in transit from Mena to Little Rock. Um, any, any evidence uh, well, for that? Well, again, you know, without saying too much, uh, there, there, there is going to be some testimony from me that, um, and it's, and it's very little, but uh, there is some connection just, just that I know of. Now, I was the first investigator that was assigned to that case uh, on the boys' deaths and was taken off of it, so you can make your inference and go from there on it. But it's something that is going to resurface. It was a tragic event. By now, another eyewitness had emerged who had seen Harmon with Kevin and Don at the tracks the night of the murder. After confirming the truthfulness of the witness, the FBI offered to place the witness in protective custody and instructed John to turn over all of his information to them, promising to solve the case before the end of 1994. The FBI also stated that Chuck Banks would be charged with obstruction of justice, which prompted Gene Duffy to come out of hiding. In June of 1994, Gene and John Brown met for the first time. During that meeting, she would share with me all of her files. At that time, I realized why I had not been allowed to look at the 1990 federal grand jury investigation that was conducted during the time frame she was still in Arkansas. It was then I realized why she was really run out of town was real shocking to find out that what Gene Duffy found in 1990 were the same things I was finding in 1994. Drug trafficking that involved political figures, law enforcement officers, involved in the cover-ups, uh, cover-ups of deaths. Four years later, separately and independently from anything she ever done, I tracked almost the same thing identical that she did. Right straight to law enforcement personnel, right straight to the state capitol. At the Arkansas State Capitol, Governor Clinton shared an adjoining office with state drug czar Robert Shepard. Shepard, a former sheriff from Dan Harmon's district, was appointed by Clinton to lead Arkansas's so-called war on drugs. On at least three occasions, Shepard attempted to suppress investigations into Kevin and Don's murders. In 1990, Shepard paid a visit to U.S. Attorney Chuck Banks to persuade him that Gene Duffy should be ignored. In 1993, Shepard told John Brown that his career would be better off if he concentrated his efforts elsewhere. And in 1995, FBI agent Phyllis Cornyn reported that Shepard had attempted to interfere with the case. The fact is, we know who killed these kids. The problem is now, how long are we gonna wait? How long is it gonna take before we make the decision that we're gonna indict the murderers and we're also going to indict the people that covered this thing up. Paula Casey, the U.S. District Attorney in Little Rock, has said, we're not going to talk about airplane drops. Why? That's why they were killed. How long do they have to go before justice prevails in Arkansas? When the MENA connection was made in my mind and I looked back on everything that had happened, I knew it was the only thing that had ever made sense to me. And this information had been available for years, but had been suppressed. Of course, now I look back on the chain of events and realize that I likely caused the shutdown of my own investigation. It's clear to me that the turning point was when I gave Chuck Banks the information 
uh, developed by my task force that the boys were killed because they had stumbled upon a large shipment of drugs dropped from an airplane. In my heart, I feel that that was a red flag that caused Chuck Banks to close the investigation down before it led to Mina. Uh, early on, the media did extensive coverage on Kevin and Don's death and helped us to keep pressure on our public officials over this case. But when it came to the political pressure, the MENA connection involved, they dropped the ball, perpetuating the cover-up. There's some people in the media that know the whole story. Uh, I had a reporter call, and I met with him, and it became obvious that he knew a lot more about MENA, Arkansas, the ongoing drug operation in Arkansas, money laundering. I mean, this guy was phenomenal. He even had records. He'd done his own research. He'd been doing it for years. Um, he works for a major newspaper in, in, in Arkansas now. And I said, you've got all this. I mean, you've got the story. Why don't you print it? And he said, do you really think they'd let me print this? He said, there's no way, John. And freedom of speech is supposed to be alive and well. And this man tells me he can't print the truth. It was now more than eight years since the incident on the tracks. The pieces of the puzzle had finally come together. Eyewitnesses had implicated several people in the murders and subsequent cover-up, including Prosecutor Dan Harmon, Deputy Prosecutor Richard Garrett, Sheriff Jim Steed, and Officers Jay Campbell, Kirk Lane, and Danny Allen. Throughout his career, Dan Harmon has been protected by the powerful and corrupt in Arkansas. In 1990, he was arrested on four misdemeanor counts of tax evasion. At his arraignment, he was ordered to take a routine drug test which would have allowed him to go free. He refused and spent 18 days in jail. Harmon was later convicted of one of the charges and was sentenced by the notorious U.S. District Judge Henry Woods to one year probation, the absolute minimum allowed. As a result of his conviction, Harmon's law license was suspended. The suspension, however, was rescinded after a long list of high-ranking Arkansas officials, including Attorney General Winston Bryant, testified on Harmon's behalf. For many years, Bryant had been involved in the MENA drug smuggling investigations. More recently, at least 15 domestic violence complaints filed against Harmon by a number of his ex-wives have surfaced. The complaints, some of which Harmon has admitted to, range from holding a gun to his wife's head to biting off the thumb of one of his victims. Charges were never filed, and the reports were kept from the public by Harmon's friend, Benton Police Chief Rick Elmendorf. Dan Harmon continued to receive extremely favorable treatment from the Arkansas press. His continued re-election as Saline County Prosecutor also gave him control over the drug task force, Gene Duffy's old job. In November 1995, a package containing fake cocaine labeled as evidence belonging to Harmon's drug task force was found in the possession of Harmon's wife, Holly. An investigation revealed the package had originally contained more than $100,000 worth of pure cocaine, which was now missing. A combined raid by the FBI and DEA confiscated drug-related files from Harmon's home and office. A racketeering case against Harmon was reportedly being built. However, after years of seeing similar investigations go nowhere, a weary public remains understandably skeptical. Finally, on November 29, 1995, the FBI, referring to Kevin and Don's murders, announced to Linda Ives that in light of the fact there is no evidence, it's time you consider the fact that a crime has not been committed. The obstruction of justice continues. There aren't any words in the English language that can describe how it makes you feel as a parent or as a citizen of Arkansas uh, to see what our officials um, are capable of doing. Um, you know, I think we were just kind of uh, naive, um, common, ordinary people. Got up and went to work every day and came home and went to bed uh, and assumed that everybody else did the same thing and tried to do what was right. And uh, I think Kevin's death has been uh, the rudest awakening that anybody could ever have uh, to see what really goes on and to see what's important to elected and public officials. This is not a political issue with me. Um, we were never a political family. 
Uh, our lives revolved around the ball field and going to the lake uh, and all of the things that a family does uh, until the Arkansas political machine reached into our lives and destroyed the tranquility that we had. And uh, I want the American people to know that we have to stand up against this kind of corruption and we have to hold our officials accountable and make them work for us instead of against us. In my experience, I believe what is happening here in Arkansas is only a small sample as to what is happening nationwide. And I believe that all of America has to stand up and rescue the American system of justice. Hello, my name is Pat Matriciano. I'm the producer of the video Obstruction of Justice. When I first heard of the plight of Linda Ives, I was moved to do whatever I could to assist the Ives family in obtaining justice. The making of this video is my way of helping to achieve that goal. Since the video's initial release in 1996, a number of significant events involving this case have transpired. Events which could have a potentially devastating effect on this nation. I would like to take this opportunity to bring you up to date. After nearly a decade of character assassination by Dan Harmon and members of the Arkansas media, Gene Duffy was finally vindicated. It became obvious 
that she had been telling the truth all along when on May 13, 1997, Harmon was convicted in federal court on a number of charges, including drug trafficking, extortion, abuse of power, and racketeering. The racketeering charge was an indication Harmon had been involved in organized crime. What was the racketeering charge again, if that, that appears to be, is that what you're saying is the most important one? That is, that is the most serious charge, and the racketeering charge um, is, is that he was operating the prosecuting attorney's office and the drug task force for his own benefit. As a so criminal, criminal organization. Yes, so that's it's the criminal most, organization. So it's the most symbolic. Uh, it's the most serious. Harmon is currently serving time in federal prison. His convictions have become an embarrassment to the Arkansas political elite who have vigorously defended him over the years. The walls of the corrupt Arkansas political machine and the corrupt media that protected it were finally beginning to crack. Missing from the charges against Harmon, however, was the charge of murder. This was inexplicable since an eyewitness had stepped forward who could identify Dan Harmon as being on the tracks with Kevin and Don on the night of their murders. This witness had previously passed an FBI polygraph and had been placed in protective custody by the FBI. So would you say you're 100% sure? I was 200% sure it was Danny Harmon, without any doubt. Without any doubt. I think that if the murder charge had been included in the RICO count as it should have been, there may very well have been a murder conviction today as well, and I'm very disappointed that uh, and angry that the government refused to include that in their RICO count. Uh, I, I believe that the case deserves to be heard before a jury at least. Uh, and I think the outcome could have been very similar today. He could have been a convicted murderer. Our search for justice suffered a tremendous blow when in 1997, I was sued for $16 million by two Arkansas police officers whose names were mentioned during one scene in the tape. This was the scene in question. Eyewitnesses had implicated several people in the murders and subsequent cover-up, including Prosecutor Dan Harmon, Deputy Prosecutor Richard Garrett, Sheriff Jim Steed, and Officers Jay Campbell, Kirk Lane, and Danny Allen. This is News 4 at 10, where the news comes first. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for watching. I'm Kent Bates. I'm Denise Whitaker. Our lead story tonight takes us to federal court and a civil trial expected to wrap up with a verdict today. Instead, it's a few days off for a federal jury deliberating a defamation suit. The suit claims two Pulaski County deputies are wrongly connected to a double murder. Bob Clausen joins us from the News Center with more. Bob? Well, Denise, this is all about a documentary that outlines the murder of Don Henry and Kevin Ives, said to have been killed by a train initially, but some investigators say that they were murdered after witnessing a drug drop back in 1987. Over the past five days, the jury has sat through testimony defending and attacking the documentary. Tonight at issue, did the documentary's producer wrongly attach Lieutenant Jay Campbell and Lieutenant Kirk Lane to the alleged crime, and should they receive compensation? If we lose this suit, this is not a blow just to us. We're just little people. It is a blow to everybody that's in the media, every television station, Every video producer, every movie maker is going to be held accountable in a way that is very dangerous. Regardless, their attorney says that their reputations have been seriously damaged by the allegations. Now, some people are convinced the young men were killed by law enforcement and that a cover-up began immediately. However, that has never been proven, and that is not the issue before the jury. This is a civil trial. Both men have said that money is not the issue here. They say that they want to be disconnected from the allegations that they played a role in the death of two young men. Bob, thank you. Officers Jay Campbell and Kirk Lane filed a lawsuit in the U.S. District Court against myself and my company. The star witness for their side turned out to be none other than Detective John Brown. While under oath, John Brown perjured himself by claiming he'd warned me not to use Campbell or Lane's name in the video. This was a lie. Brown never said not to use their names, and in fact, had insisted to me and my staff that they were indeed the primary suspects in the Ives-Henry murders. Both Linda Ives and Jean Duffy concurred with this conclusion and testified in trial that they believed Campbell and Lane were the hands-on killers 
and that the government was protecting them. In this unused video clip, Brown once again repeats his belief that Jay Campbell and Kirk Lane are the primary suspects in the Ives Henry murders. You mentioned Jay Campbell earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he called me no, about a month and a half ago and asked me Fine. if I'd heard about Lasser being involved in anything else. Watch what you say to Jay Campbell. Be real careful. Because I've known Jay, Jay Campbell for about eight years. I don't care. You be real careful. Who is that? Jay Campbell's head, head of the, the Narcotics Division for Pulaski County. There's been, you know, rumors circulating in Pulaski County for a number of years about about Jay. Um, I have heard several reports of and intelligence reports that he he is involved in some stuff he shouldn't be involved in. Well, I've seen intelligence reports where Jay Campbell's admitted that he was telling Dan Lester when they were looking at him on drugs. With the paperwork that we've got, it's listed in there where Jay Campbell was flying to Fayetteville with them and was actually telling them about was telling Lasseter, hey, you're being investigated. The problem I have with it, he and Kirk Lane both, is uh, are very early on in the Henry and Ives homicide, the two boys on the tracks, their name appeared as possible suspects. John Brown's friend and an assistant on the case, Constable Harmon Reeves, also confirmed what John Brown had always maintained was the truth about the case. Don and Kevin had been on the tracks and uh, uh, approached by another group of people, which is uh, Mr. Harmon and four other people, and they ran up away from them and got away. And then, uh, as the boys were were trying to call for help or add a phone, uh, that's when Mr. Campbell, and Mr. Lane, pulled up and apprehended them at that point. Kirk Lane and Jay Campbell pulled up in the car and jumped out to grab the two boys, and one went after Don, one went after Kevin. Kevin, the 22, it was leaned up against one of the posts there, and he reached around to get the 22 to come around. When he did, every which officer was grabbing for him, grabbed the, the 22 from him and swung around and hit Kevin beside the head with a, a sharp blow enough to knock him unconscious at that point. It wasn't until a lawsuit was filed against me by Campbell and Lane that John Brown decided to change his story. Before I even knew I was being sued, Brown had met with Campbell and his attorney and had filed a false affidavit stating he had been edited out of context. However, not one instance of Brown being edited out of context could be found. In fact, John Brown had previously given his approval over the content of the finished video, committed my staff a number of times for their work in the video, promoted the video on scores of radio programs, ordered more than 300 copies of the video, which he sold for profit, and used the video as part of an unsuccessful campaign for sheriff. John Brown had succeeded in doing what Dan Harmon, Chuck Banks, and the FBI had done a decade before. That is, to win the trust of Linda Ives, to take charge of the investigation, and then to systematically destroy it. Much of the evidence supporting our case was barred from the courtroom by the judge, including testimony concerning the disappearance of an eyewitness who could identify Campbell and Lane as the killers. Also barred were state police reports describing intimidation and violence by Campbell and Lane against witnesses in other cases. A number of character witnesses testified on behalf of Campbell and Lane detailing what great guys, caring people, and trusted officers they were. However, as with Dan Harmon before them, these witnesses turned out to be wrong. Following my trial, Campbell was fired by the Pulaski County Sheriff's Department for intimidating and blacklisting fellow officers and for falsifying reports. One of the character witnesses who testified on behalf of Campbell, that is FBI agent Mike Smith, was not allowed to be impeached or cross-examined by our attorney regarding his bias, prejudice, and conflict of interest. Ultimately, the jury was made to feel that they had no choice but to find in favor of the plaintiffs and against us. The judge cited John Brown's testimony as the key factor in upholding the jury's decision.
Our lead story tonight, there is a verdict in the federal civil defamation trial brought by two sheriff's deputies against the makers of a documentary film. A jury today found the filmmakers guilty of publishing a false and damaging statement about two Pulaski County Sheriff's lieutenants. Kim Miller has been covering this trial this past week. She joins us now from the News Center. Kim? Kent, the jury ordered the filmmaker to pay the lieutenants a total just under $600,000. The case started when Jeremiah Films produced a documentary about the murders of two boys found on Saline County tra train tracks in 1987. $109,750 in compensatory damages and $200,000 in punitive for Lieutenant Jay Campbell. Lieutenant Kirk Lane was awarded $89,000 compensatory damages and $200,000 punitive. Those involved in making the film say the case is by no means over. We will argue for a directed verdict. And if we, uh, if we don't receive one, uh, we will appeal. Uh, and I believe that uh, justice will prevail in the end. We're not going to give up. I, I don't think there's any doubt in anybody's mind what the facts were and that Linda and I are absolutely convinced that um, the plaintiffs were the hands-on killers. I've been told by a number of insiders that I am receiving political payback as a result of my involvement in an earlier video called The Clinton Chronicles. Whether or not that's the case, this type of legal harassment must not be allowed to continue. Should the ruling on this case stand, it will set one of the most dangerous precedents in American history. From now on, free speech will be severely limited. Small companies such as mine who wish to hold public officials accountable for their actions may very well be threatened with legal action and put out of business. Individuals will be forced to reconsider before saying or publishing anything negative about any public official. This case is now in the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. Regardless of the outcome, we're going to continue to fight on behalf of Linda Ives and do whatever we can to see that justice will prevail. Since the finding against the producer of Obstruction of Justice, Pat Matriciana, Jeremiah Films, and Citizens for Honest Government, that finding has now been reversed by the United States Court of Appeals, Eighth District by a unanimous vote of all judges, dismissing all claims by Jay Campbell and Kurt Lane, and finding in favor of Pat Matriciana, Jeremiah Films, and Citizens for Honest Government. The First Amendment has been upheld. Hello, my name is Pat Matriciano. I'm the producer of the video, Obstruction of Justice. When I first heard of the plight of Linda Ives, I was moved to do whatever I could to assist the Ives family in obtaining justice. The making of this video is my way of helping to achieve that goal. Since the video's initial release in 1996, a number of significant events involving this case have transpired. Events which could have a potentially devastating effect on this nation. I would like to take this opportunity to bring you up to date. After nearly a decade of character assassination by Dan Harmon and members of the Arkansas media, Jean Duffy was finally vindicated. It became obvious that she had been telling the truth all along when on May 13, 1997, Harmon was convicted in federal court on a number of charges, including drug trafficking, extortion, abuse of power, and racketeering. The racketeering charge was an indication Harmon had been involved in organized crime. What was the racketeering charge again? If that, that appears to be, is that what you're saying is the most important one? That is, that is the most serious charge. And the racketeering charge uh, is, is that he was operating the prosecuting attorney's office and the drug task force for his own benefit. As a so criminal organization. organization. Yes, so that's it's the most, criminal organization. So it's the most symbolic. Uh, it's the most serious. Harmon is currently serving time in federal prison. His convictions have become an embarrassment to the Arkansas political elite who have vigorously defended him over the years. The walls of the corrupt Arkansas political machine and the corrupt media that protected it were finally beginning to crack. Missing from the charges against Harmon, however, was the charge of murder. 
This was inexplicable since an eyewitness had stepped forward who could identify Dan Harmon as being in the tracks with Kevin and Don on the night of their murders. This witness had previously passed an FBI polygraph and had been placed in protective custody by the FBI. So would you say you're 100% sure? Because I was 200% sure it was Danny Harmon, without any doubt. Without any doubt. I think that if the murder charge had been included in the RICO count as it should have been, there may very well have been a murder conviction today as well, and I'm very disappointed that, uh, and angry that the government refused to include that in their RICO count. Uh, I, I believe that the case deserves to be heard before a jury at least, uh, and I think the outcome could have been very similar today. He could have been a convicted murderer. Our search for justice suffered a tremendous blow when in 1997 I was sued for $16 million by two Arkansas police officers whose names were mentioned during one scene in the tape. This was the scene in question. Eyewitnesses had implicated several people in the murders and subsequent cover-up, including Prosecutor Dan Harmon, Deputy Prosecutor Richard Garrett, Sheriff Jim Steed, and Officers Jay Campbell Kirk Lane and Danny Allen. This is News 4 at 10, where the news comes first. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for watching. I'm Kent Bates. I'm Denise Whitaker. Our lead story tonight takes us to federal court and a civil trial expected to wrap up with a verdict today. Instead, it's a few days off for a federal jury deliberating a defamation suit. The suit claims two Pulaski County deputies are wrongly connected to a double murder. Bob Clausen joins us from the News Center with more. Bob? Well, Denise, this is all about a documentary that outlines the murder of Don Henry and Kevin Ives, said to have been killed by a train initially, but some investigators say that they were murdered after witnessing a drug drop back in 1987. Over the past five days, the jury has sat through testimony defending and attacking the documentary tonight at issue. Did the documentary's producer wrongly attach Lieutenant Jay Campbell and Lieutenant Kirk Lane to the alleged crime, and should they receive compensation? If we lose this suit, this is not a blow just to us. We're just little people. It is a blow to everybody that's in the media. Every television station, every video producer, every movie maker is going to be held accountable in a way that is very dangerous. Regardless, their attorney says that their reputations have been seriously damaged by the allegations. Now, some people are convinced the young men were killed by law enforcement and that a cover-up began immediately. However, that has never been proven, and that is not the issue before the jury. This is a civil trial. Both men have said that money is not the issue here. They say that they want to be disconnected from the allegations that they played a role in the death of two young men. Bob, thank you. Officers Jay Campbell and Kirk Lane filed a lawsuit in the U.S. District Court against myself and my company. The star witness for their side turned out to be none other than Detective John Brown. While under oath, John Brown perjured himself by claiming he'd warned me not to use Campbell or Lane's name in the video. This was a lie. Brown never said not to use their names and in fact had insisted to me and my staff that they were indeed the primary suspects in the Ives-Henry murders. Both Linda Ives and Jean Duffy concurred with this conclusion and testified in trial that they believed Campbell and Lane were the hands-on killers and that the government was protecting them. In this unused video clip, Brown once again repeats his belief that Jay Campbell and Kirk Lane are the primary suspects in the Ives-Henry murders. You mentioned Jay Campbell earlier. Yeah, yeah. Um, he called me no, about a month and a half ago and asked me right. if I'd heard about Lasser being involved in anything else. Watch what you said, Jay Campbell. Be real careful. Because I've known Jay, Jay for Campbell about eight years. I don't care. Be real careful. Who is that? Jay Campbell's head, head of the, the narcotics division for Pulaski County. There's been, you know, rumors circulating in Pulaski County for a number of years about about Jay, um, I have heard several reports of, and intelligence reports that he he is involved in some stuff he shouldn't be involved in. Well, I've seen intelligence reports where Jay Campbell's admitted that he was telling Dan Lester when they were looking at him on drugs. With the paperwork that we've got, it's listed in there where Jay Campbell was flying to Fayetteville with them and was actually telling them about, was telling Lester, hey, you're being investigated. The problem I have with it 
he and Kirk Lane both, is uh, are very early on in the Henry Knives homicide, the two boys on the tracks, their name appeared as possible suspects. John Brown's friend and an assistant on the case, Constable Harmon Reeves, also confirmed what John Brown had always maintained was the truth about the case. Don and Kevin had been on the tracks and uh, uh, approached by another group of people, which was uh, Mr. Harmon and four other people, and they ran up away from them and got away. And then uh, as the boys were, were trying to call for help or add a phone, uh, that's when Mr. Campbell and Mr. Lane pulled up and apprehended them at that point. Kirk Lane and Jay Campbell pulled up in the car and jumped out to grab the two boys. And one went after Don, one went after Kevin. Kevin, the 22, it was leaned up against one of the posts there and he reached around to get the 22 to come around. When he did, every which officer was grabbing for him, grabbed the, t the 22 from him and swung around and hit Kevin beside the head with a, a sharp blow enough to knock him unconscious at that point. It wasn't until a lawsuit was filed against me by Campbell and Lane that John Brown decided to change his story. Before I even knew I was being sued, Brown had met with Campbell and his attorney and had filed a false affidavit stating he had been edited out of context. However, not one instance of Brown being edited out of context could be found. In fact, John Brown had previously given his approval over the content of the finished video, commended my staff a number of times for their work in the video, promoted the video on scores of radio programs, ordered more than 300 copies of the video, which he sold for profit, and used the video as part of an unsuccessful campaign for sheriff. John Brown had succeeded in doing what Dan Harmon, Chuck Banks, and the FBI had done a decade before. That is, to win the trust of Linda Ives, to take charge of the investigation, and then to systematically destroy it. Much of the evidence supporting our case was barred from the courtroom by the judge, including testimony concerning the disappearance of an eyewitness who could identify Campbell and Lane as the killers. Also barred were state police reports describing intimidation and violence by Campbell and Lane against witnesses in other cases. A number of character witnesses testified on behalf of Campbell and Lane, detailing what great guys, caring people, and trusted officers they were. However, as with Dan Harmon before them, these witnesses turned out to be wrong. Following my trial, Campbell was fired by the Pulaski County Sheriff's Department for intimidating and blacklisting fellow officers and for falsifying reports. One of the character witnesses who testified on behalf of Campbell, that is FBI agent Mike Smith, was not allowed to be impeached or cross-examined by our attorney regarding his bias, prejudice, and conflict of interest. Ultimately, the jury was made to feel that they had no choice but to find in favor of the plaintiffs and against us. The judge cited John Brown's testimony as the key factor in upholding the jury's decision. Our lead story tonight, there is a verdict in the federal civil defamation trial brought by two sheriff's deputies against the makers of a documentary film. A jury today found the filmmakers guilty of publishing a false and damaging statement about two Pulaski County Sheriff's lieutenants. Kim Miller has been covering this trial this past week. She joins us now from the News Center. Kim? Kent, the jury ordered the filmmaker to pay the lieutenants a total just under $600,000. The case started when Jeremiah Films produced a documentary about the murders of two boys found on Saline County tra train tracks in 1987. $109,750 in compensatory damages and $200,000 in punitive for Lieutenant Jay Campbell. Lieutenant Kirk Lane was awarded $89,000 compensatory damages and $200,000 punitive. Those involved in making the film say the case is by no means over. We will argue for a directed verdict. And if we, uh, if we don't receive one, uh, we will appeal. Uh, and I believe that uh, justice will prevail in the end. Uh, we're not going to give up. I, I don't think there's any doubt in anybody's mind what the facts were <laughs> and that Linda and I are absolutely convinced that um, the plaintiffs were the hands-on killers. I've been told by a number of insiders that I am receiving political payback as a result of my involvement in an earlier video called The Clinton Chronicles. 
whether or not that's the case, this type of legal harassment must not be allowed to continue. Should the ruling on this case stand, it will set one of the most dangerous precedents in American history. From now on, free speech will be severely limited. Small companies such as mine who wish to hold public officials accountable for their actions may very well be threatened with legal action and put out of business. Individuals will be forced to reconsider before saying or publishing anything negative about any public official. This case is now in the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. Regardless of the outcome, we're going to continue to fight on behalf of Linda Ives and do whatever we can to see that justice will prevail. Since the finding against the producer of Obstruction of Justice, Pat Patriciana, Jeremiah Films, and Citizens for Honest Government, that finding has now been reversed by the United States Court of Appeals, 8th District, by a unanimous vote of all judges, dismissing all claims by Jay Campbell and Kurt Lang, and finding in favor of Pat Patriciana, Jeremiah Films, and Citizens for Honest Government. The First Amendment has been upheld.